Right, hello everybody. Welcome to today's video. This is episode 7 of my Ant Keeping Care Guide playlist and today we're going to be speaking about the very beautiful unique species known as Crematogaster scutellaris. Now in the previous episode we've just spoke about Cataglyphus velox if you haven't seen that already I'll leave a link up top here somewhere for you guys to go ahead and check out. And before we go ahead and jump into the video as always I want to say a big thank you and a massive shout out to the Ant Lady. Her links will be down below in the video descriptions. So make sure you guys go ahead and check out her Instagram page and her store. The Ant Lady is the person who's sponsoring all my uh, Care Guide playlist videos so if it wasn't for her I wouldn't have the beautiful species that I have and I wouldn't be making these videos for you guys. So big shout out to Tracy, thank you very much. And if you do enjoy today's video, it would mean a lot to me if you could drop a like, leave a comment, subscribe if you haven't already, give me some opinions on species that you'd like to have K-Guides made on, and uh, with all that being said, let's go ahead and jump into the video. So Cramonogaster scutellaris are an easy species to maintain, and as you can see, they're such a small, unique looking species. First thing we'll notice with these is that they have that small red head with that heart-shaped, diamond-shaped gaster at the back that's in black. So when these girls feel threatened, they'll actually raise the gasters up in the air above their heads to make them look a bit larger and more intimidating to the prey or whatever it is that's making them feel threatened. This is also used to spray formic acid. Now they don't actually do it as an attack to their enemies like some other species do, but it's more of a warning towards other ants in the colony to let them know of danger that's in the area. Due to these girls also having such a fast growth rate, they're actually known to be an invasive species and some people even class them as a pest all around Europe. This species is also monogene, meaning they only have a single queen per colony, but don't let this put you off because these girls can be very, very intimidating and they can reach the numbers of an average of around maybe 10,000 workers per colony. The queen's also claustral as well, so this means that she'll, she'll go into founding and she'll raise her first workers all the way up uh, from her eggs without feeding, so she'll use the foods that's stored inside her body already to uh, raise her first generation of nanotics. So if you do decide to get a colony of these and you get a queen just to start with, just cover her up, keep her at the correct temperature and humidity, leave her nice and dark in peace and check her out in a few weeks time and she'll do very well and she'll raise them up no problem. Now they're actually really cool as well because they leave um, like a chemtrail and for those of you who don't know, let's just say for an example here, you can see these ants are busy now enjoying some blueberry uh, liquid sugars. They'll actually leave a scent trail of pheromones all the way back from the nest and they'll actually follow out in the line and they can cover quite a large distance with these chemtrails as well. And you'll see videos of other ant keepers. I think it's the um the ant keeper, the Australian bloke he showed a video where an invasion species uh, an invasive species, sorry, <laughs> gone into his house while he was away and uh, they killed off a lot of his colonies and there was just like chemtrails of them from outside his house all the way up his walls, through his windows and through his entire house. So these girls are actually very fascinating on so many different levels as well. So if there's a little description about these girls being given, let's uh, take a little look inside the nest, see how they're doing inside there, and we'll speak about what requirements are needed to raise yourself a successful colony. So as we look inside, she has the queen's lying on a nice big pile of brood there, and she has plenty of workers around her, and they're all doing their own little bit to raise the colony, look after them, they're feeding them and care, caring for them and cleaning them and stuff. So starting off with your temperatures in the nest, you want it between 21 and 25 degrees. And then in the outworld, you want it between 20 to 28. Humidity wise, you want it between 50 to 60% inside the nest. And then in the outworld, 30 to 50. Now my species absolutely love the heat and you'll notice them in a test tube if you get them. Wherever the heat cable lies on the test tube, they'll actually lie directly on top of that. But of course, just make sure you have them at the correct temperature because you don't want to give them too much heat as much as they enjoy because you do not want to cook and kill your ants at all. Now they do hibernate from the back end of November to the end of February at around 15 degrees. Now mine have slowed down a fair bit recently, um, but like I say, November I will be uh, dropping the temperatures down. I'm gradually doing it now for all my ants, um, but these will get the... 15 degrees at the end of November and I'll raise the temperatures up in February and bring them out of hibernation around the uh, back end of Feb. So nutrition wise, just like any other ant species, they need a constant supply of fresh clean water and um, they'll absolutely sink any amounts of liquid sugars that you give them, mine absolutely love it. And protein wise, they will demolish anything you give them. Do not let the size of these little girls put you off, they are absolutely ferocious when it comes to uh, protein. 
I'll give mine like a, a half a dubia roach and they will clear the entire thing out within like two days and there'll be nothing left of it at all, just the hard exoskeleton. So always have a fresh supply of cream water, liquid sugars and um, plenty of protein. And while we're speaking about the size of them, this is them in a mini outworld from High Tech Ants and you'll see they're just absolutely tiny but they're everywhere now the queen can range between seven and nine millimeters where the workers are only three to four now this pretty much sums up the scoot laris care guide and it's going to bring our video to an end now this is my colony of them and i've raised this colony from a single queen i homed mine in a tubs and tube setup for quite a while and then just recently i've upgraded them if you didn't see that previous video to the new uh, version for the high tech and stuff so now they moved in here, they've got plenty of space um, from the tubs and tubes setup, which is a lot better and it's a lot easier for them. And like I said, they're absolutely protein hungry. They'll demolish any kind of insect that you put in for them and they'll go absolutely crazy for sugars. Now you can see them all huddled up there on the left for the um, for the blueberry li air liquids. I love the way that sometimes they'll run around with the gasters up in the air like in a defensive way, like what I was speaking about earlier. It just looks absolutely crazy for such a small ant to raise the gaster up in the hip of the hen, just run around and they'll wiggle it around it almost in like a um, like a tapping type of motion. It looks uh, pretty cool. If you wish to stay up to date with myself, me and colonies outside of YouTube, or even just to try and contact us, feel free to follow me on Instagram or even join my community Discord. Everyone is welcome, and the links to both will be down in the video description below, listed alongside my Patreon and Twitch. So that is it guys, thank you very much for watching today's video and I hope that this really does help you guys out if you are looking to get a colony of Cremitogaster Scutellaris. Now if anyone watching this video believes that I might have missed something out or I've got something wrong, please feel free to drop it down in the comments below, correct us, I'll not take no offence from it and also it'll help any viewers who are looking through the comments for any further additional information about this colony. Now unfortunately I haven't yet decided on what species I'm going to be covering just next, obviously it's now... Uh, late October and hibernation is around the corner I may wait off with the care guides until we pass over hibernation just so it's safer for the answer unless I get anything else that doesn't hibernate but uh, at the moment I'm probably going to wait until after hibernation unless we get something that's going to be okay to do but anyways all you've got to do is turn on that bell icon to turn your notifications on so you don't miss out on anything that I upload in the future and once again, a massive thank you to Tracy, the ant lady, for supplying me with all the beautiful uh, ant colonies that I have. Once again, if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have what I got. And again, just a big thank you to Tracy, the ant lady, uh, who sponsors all the videos. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have the species I've got, and I wouldn't be making these care guide videos for you. So big up to Tracy, and like I said before, all the links for anything you need will be down below in the video description. Cheers again to everyone watching today's video. I hope you've enjoyed it, I hope it helps, and I'll catch you in the next one. Big love.